Okay, so the, the last topic here for today, the last topic of the year that we'll start today is sketching polynomials. So in math, a lot of times sketches are more valuable to us than graphs. You've seen me battle with this this year. I want to show you something on a graph in Desmos, and especially when you're working with functions that like polynomials where there's big powers of x. A lot of times it's difficult to see the whole thing because it, it grows so fast vertically and you got to really fool around with the window in order to get it to a point where you can even see the whole thing. Does that make sense? And then sometimes when you squeeze it down to where you can see the whole thing, some of the, some of the features are, you know, they fit on the screen, but some of the other features that might be interesting on the graph are so small you can barely see them, right? So sometimes sketches are better. Sometimes sketches are better because a lot of times in math when we're doing analysis, when we're, we're using a function maybe to model something, for example, and, and we want to understand what's going on with the function, a lot of times we just need to know what the shape of the curve is and we need to know what the coordinates are of some of the interesting places, like for example, the minima and the maxima, peaks and the valleys, right? maybe points of inflection where the function is, sometimes you think of that as a point of diminishing returns on a graph. And that's all calculus stuff that we'll get to in a couple of years. Uh, we do a lot, we do a whole section on, on curve sketching and calculus where we're just gonna build on the ideas that we're just starting today. But you'll see as we get into calculus, even to, even to a greater degree here, that the sketches sometimes are more important than the graph, okay? So our goal today is to be able to sketch polynomials. And the, and the points that we're interested in today, the things we're interested in on the graph, we're interested in knowing where the x-intercepts are in our sketch. And we want to know what is the function doing between the x-intercepts and at the tails of the function. Okay, and that's really it. Okay. All right, so let's start off by looking at, I'm going to pull up I'm going to pull up a, a, a graph here, or a Desmos document, and I want you guys to do, I want you to explain some things to me on Desmos here. Okay, so what about this? If I let A equal 0 0.05, so A is a positive constant, right? I want to know what is the, based on our discussions of polynomials earlier in the unit, what is the end behavior going to be of f of x. So you're going to have to probably look at that and think about it for a second. But I want to know what's the end behavior going to be. And we talk about end behavior. Remember what that is. I want you to be able to answer the questions as x approaches infinity. So as we go infinitely far to the right on our graph, what's y doing? Or as x approaches negative infinity, what is f of x doing? What's y doing? Okay. So I want to know what's the end behavior going to be? Okay, positive on the right end, right? Okay, so let's, let's look at that one first of all. Suggestion is positive. The right end behavior is positive. Looks good, right? As we go to the right, uh, it looks like this function is just going up forever. And if I, if I kind of zoom, zoom out a little bit, we can see it just keeps going, right? Okay. How about the left end behavior? What's the left end behavior going to do? Can anybody tell me? It is. It's going down to negative infinity. So as x approaches infinity, f of x approaches infinity. As x approaches negative infinity, f of x approaches negative infinity. How'd you get that, Abby? How'd you? Mm -hmm. Okay, how'd you know, 
I mean, look, that's a complicated looking function. B, C, D, J, and K have some values down here, but we don't even really care about those for the moment. If I were to multiply this whole thing out, if I were to expand that whole thing out, it would take a really long time because I have to multiply things in pairs, right? So I'd have to multiply together the first two factors, simplify it, then I'd have to distribute X minus D to that whole thing and simplify it and so on and so forth. What's the leading term of that polynomial going to be when all is said and done? X to what power? Everybody see that? Give me thumbs on that. Okay, how come? Because isn't the leading term of the polynomial going to be what I get when I distribute the x's all the way through? In the first case, when I, did, when I foil it out, I'm going to get an x squared, right? And then when, I, then when I distribute this, I'm going to get an x cubed plus some other stuff. And then when I distribute this to all that stuff, I'm going to get an x to the fourth plus a bunch of other stuff. And eventually, when I distribute this one, I'm going to get an x to the fifth plus, plus a bunch of other stuff. So the leading term is x to the fifth times my a, which is positive, right? Okay, do you guys remember earlier in the year when we started talking about polynomials, I, I did a little trick on Desmos where I gave you a function that ended up being, I think it was a quartic function, but the coefficients were really small for the x to the fourth term and a little bit bigger, but still small for the x cubed term and, when, when, and so on and so forth. When we focused in on the constant, I mean, when we focused in really closely, we were zoomed in, it looked like a line, right? And so when we were really far zoomed in, the function looked linear. But as we zoomed out, we realized, oh, okay, no, it's not linear. Then it looked quadratic, and then it looked cubic, and eventually it looked quartic when we zoomed out far enough, and it stayed that way. If we zoomed out far enough, we couldn't even tell the difference between the x to the fourth parent function and the function that we graphed. Remember that? Okay. Give me, do you, do you guys all remember that? The moral of the story was that it's the leading term that dominates the large scale behavior of any function, right? So the end behavior. When x gets really big in the positive or negative direction, the leading term of a polynomial just takes over, right? And so we know that the leading term here would have been a, which is a positive number, x to the fifth, an odd power function, x to the fifth, has what kind of end behavior? If it's an odd power of x, it goes up to the right and down to the left, right? If it's an even power of x, it's doing that. It's going up on both, both tails go up, right? Okay? So look what happens then if we compare this function to just plain old uh, ax to the fifth. Well, look what happens. It, it looks, at this point, they, they don't look that similar, but if I zoom out far enough, they start to look in, indistinguishable, right? I'm not going to mess around with the graph and change the x-axis and all that, but I could, right? I mean, we, we could, we could, we could uh, lengthen the x-axis out and continue to zoom in vertically, and eventually these two, you know, they would look almost indistinguishable, right? Actually, let me just take a second just to hit this point home here. So what if I do this? I'm going to make the x-axis go from negative 1 to positive 1. Oops, that's not what I did though, is it? It's negative 1 to positive 1. And now let me zoom out from there. And we can start to see, yeah, those are looking pretty similar, aren't they? Right, it's that leading term that dominates the function. They look almost indistinguishable, right? Okay. So then, given that argument, I want to know, everybody do this on their own here for a second. What about g of x? I want to know, what's the end behavior of g of x going to be? Okay, the leading term is going to be what power of x? But give me thumbs thumbs up or down. Do you agree with that? Okay, yeah, good. That's right. X to the fourth. 
a is is the coefficient of the x to the fourth in this case going to be positive or negative? Yeah, I'm going to get a negative 0.25 x to the fourth for my leading term, right? So a negative even power function, show me with your arms, what's the end behavior going to be like for that? Okay, good. Yeah, everybody's doing this, right? That's a negative, right? A negative even power function goes, instead of going up, the negative flips it and it goes down, right? Okay, so that's what we should expect. That's what we see, right? I've got negative end behavior to the right and the left. And if we compare that to negative uh, 0.25x to the fourth, we can once again see that if I zoom out far enough, they're going to start to look identical, aren't they? Right? Okay, give me thumbs on all this. Okay? Let's go to, so here's, here's some homework questions. Yeah, you bet. So how about this one? Which of those polynomials could potentially be a graph of that function with the blue end behavior? Yeah, it'd have to be the bottom one, wouldn't it? A negative even power function for the for the leading term. Okay, everybody agree? Yeah, it's got to be. It's got to be that guy, doesn't it? Oh, go away. There we go. about that one give me show me fingers top ones one we'll go from the top to the bottom what number okay what could that be we're just focusing on the end behavior just the blue end behavior so negative to the right, positive to the left. Which one's that going to be? Does it have to be even or odd, first of all? It's got to be odd because they're opposite, right? So then look at the odd ones. Is it one or three? going to be three, isn't it? How come? It's got to be negative, right? It's got to flip. Instead of being a regular odd power function would be up to the right, down to the left. This one's the opposite, so it's got to be negative, right? It's got to be C or whatever you'd call that third one, okay? All right. All right, next issue. Next issue. Okay. Next thing we want to explore, we want to explore the interactions of a polynomial function with the x-axis. Okay, so we want to know what are the zeros going to look like. Okay, so what if I take, uh, what if I take the top function q of x, where a is positive, and it looks like b is negative four, and c is negative one. Okay, so we've got x minus negative four, so that's x plus four, and x minus negative one, the second factor would be x plus one. So what are the zeros gonna be then? Well, negative four and negative one, right? Everybody agree? Okay, a is positive, so we should get normal even n behavior. And so there's our function, right? That's not a big surprise, is it? That looks like what we'd expect. Everybody agree? Okay. If we look at the x-intercepts, sure enough, there they are. Okay. 
are those factors linear or quadratic or cubic or what are they? They're linear, aren't they? Because the factors each have a multiplicity. Oh, man. Each have a multiplicity. Can you still hear me, Adelaide? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, the, the, the factors each have a multiplicity of 1. That makes them linear. Okay? The zeros would be linear. If, if one of the factors was squared, it would make it quadratic. That zero and that factor would be quadratic. If it's cubed, it would be a cubic, you know, a multiplicity of three, okay? So what do you notice about those, about the nature of those x-intercepts? If I zoom in on one of those, this is pretty cool. You're going to like this. You got to embrace your inner nerd on this one a little bit. Okay, describe that x-intercept for me. Does it just look like a line cutting through the x-axis? Agreed? Okay. Shouldn't it? Because that's a, that x-intercept corresponds to a linear zero, multiplicity one. Agreed? Okay. Well, let's look at a slightly more advanced uh, polynomial. But this, this one has one, two, three, four, five factors, but they're all linear. So I should expect to see something very similar, right? I'm going to expect to see five linear x-intercepts where the function is cutting through the x-axis like a line at each one of, if I zoom in, right, each one of those looks like a line cutting through the x-axis. The interactions with the x-axis are linear. Okay, now you make a prediction for me here. What's going to happen if I take, for example, the x minus c factor and I raise it to the second power? Okay. Now let's compare that to, I'm just going to pull up another Desmos here. Okay, what if I do a parent function like y equals x squared? There's my parent function. How does that interact with the x-axis? It, it just touches it, but does it cut through it like a line? No, it bounces like a parabola, like the parabola it is. And what if I do something like instead of an x, what if I make that the quantity, oops, what if I make that the quantity x minus, oh, let's say c, quantity squared, and I'm just going to add a value for c. So if c is 1, then it's got a y-intercept at 1, 0, right? If I make C something like 4, then it just slides. We know that's just transformation, right? Just I'm, it, Whatever I subtract from X tells me how far I move it to the right. If I subtract a negative or add, it moves it over to the left. But notice that that, that quadratic factor now, X minus C squared, it still is bouncing off of the X axis at X equals C. Give me thumbs on that. Okay. That's pretty cool, isn't it? I mean, this is getting to a point. You guys are starting to do some interesting things with math here now, right? So let's go back over here, and you make a prediction for me then. In this case, C is negative 1. So what do you think is going to happen at X equals negative 1 on the graph of that polynomial? What's the parabola going to do at that point? At all of these linear factors, the parabola cut through the X-axis in a linear way right, like a linear zero would. What's it going to do at that quadratic factor? You just, you just make a guess. You don't have to be right or wrong on this. It's, I mean, just, just go ahead and take a risk here. What do you think it's going to do? It's going to bounce, isn't it? Right? Let's see it in action. Ah, look at that. It bounced at x equals negative 1. What do you know? If I zoom in on that one, look what it does. It looks just like a parabola. It bounces. Now, how do I know if it's bouncing up or down? That's complicated. Knowing if it bounces up or down 
has to do with, oops, I didn't want to save that. Darn it. Anyway, that's the last thing I wanted to do. All right. We'll have to clean that up later. Um, the fact that it bounces comes from the fact that when X equals negative one, right? That, that's where we get the X intercept. We get each of these other factors is not going to be zero, right? The other factors, they're going to have some values. And it turns out that when I multiply A times whatever the value of that factor is, times that one, times that one, times that one, when I plug negative one in for X, it, all those other parts of that polynomial combine to give me some negative number. That's why it bounces down. But we couldn't have predicted that part. But we can predict that it's going to bounce there. But agree, do you get that part? Because it's a quadratic factor. What do you think is going to happen now if I all of a sudden turn, let's say, the x minus d into an x minus d quantity cubed? What do you think the interaction with the x-axis is going to be like at d? It's going to go through it like a cubic, isn't it? Right now, think about what a cubic looks like. Our cubic parent graph, so we'll let c equal 0, right? So it's just x, but instead of being squared, if we cube it, well, that's what a cubic function looks like. Notice that the interaction here is a little different. It does cut through the x-axis, but not like a line. It does it like a cubic, right? So when it cuts through the x-axis, it... The, the function becomes tangential before it curves down again, right? We call that a point of inflection in calculus. A couple of years, we'll talk about that as an inflection point. You'll know what I mean. But, it's, but if I zoom in on this, it's going to look like a horizontal line that's just, just barely touching the x-axis. It's not going to be quite horizontal, but as I zoom in, it looks more and more horizontal, right? So we should see that same kind of, of leveling off at the x-intercept on our polynomial when we graph it. Okay, well, what is D? D is one, so there it is. At X equals one, right there, if I zoom in, what do you know? That's a cubic interaction, isn't it? Isn't that cool that we can do that with a polynomial? Okay, and that doesn't, the textbooks don't really show you that stuff, but that's, that's just, that's kind of like an analysis thing for you guys that you can appreciate with this, right? We'll talk more about that in calculus. So we should be able then to do some interesting stuff with just these two concepts. So if we wanted to, for example, if we wanted to do something like this, uh, not that, not that either. Oh, okay. No, no, that's not that either. Okay, well, let's do one of these real quick, though. So there's a what degree polynomial? Sixth? Okay, what's the maximum number of real zeros that that could have? Everybody show me fingers. What's it going to be? What do you think, Liliana? Maximum number of real zeros. Right? How many complex zeros do we have to have? Six, right? By the fundamental theorem of algebra. They could all be real. And none of them, does that make sense? It might be that none of them are complex. So we could have six. Up to six real zeros. Okay, what about the next part? It has a maximum of how many x-intercepts then? Six, right? Because a real zero corresponds to an x-intercept, right? Okay, now here's one you may or may not remember. This will be a challenge. We talked about this, but do you remember the rule there? If the degree of the polynomial is six, what's the maximum number of turning points? What, how come? You're right. How come, Natalie? It, okay, it's always one less than the, than the degree, right? 
Yeah, one less than the degree. So if the degree is n, the number of turning points is n minus one. So it's five. Okay, and that's just, we talked about that, but you may not remember that. Okay, that's really not what I wanted to do anyway, though. What I wanted to do was a more fun problem like, ah, okay, like this one. Okay, let's take this function and let's see if we can pick the correct graph. Okay, so what's the end behavior going to be of this function? And all I want to know here is it positive or negative, even or odd end behavior. Okay, give, everybody give me a thumb up if you agree, thumbs down if you don't agree. Thumb sideways if you're not sure. Okay, that's right. How'd you get it, Abby? Okay, everybody see that? If, if I expanded it out, which I'm not going to do. If I expanded it out, the leading term would be 1 x to the 1, 2, 3, 4, x to the 4th, if I multiplied it all out. Give me thumbs on that. Okay, that's all, that's all there is. That's all we need to know. So the leading term would be positive x to the 4th. So it's positive even, right? It's got to be up on both right and left, and behavior is both positive, okay? All right, what about the, where are the zeros of that function? And did you hear the, there's a fourth one, where's that? What, what's the zero associated with that factor? Just apply the zero product property. If I set this thing equal to zero and solved, I'd get zero, wouldn't I? right? X would equal zero when X is zero. Okay, give me thumbs. Okay, so I know I've got X intercepts at zero, four, negative four, and eight. That's all we need to know, isn't it? If I know that the end behavior is positive, the only way I could graph this thing would be Going up on the right, it's just got to cut down through the x-axis at 8. It's got to go back up through at 4. It's got to go back down through 0 and back up through negative 4, right? It's the only way it could possibly work, isn't it? Okay. So it's got to be then, let's just look at these one at a time and tell me when you got it. That's it, isn't it? Look, there's, uh, we're going by twos, it looks like. So there's two, four, and eight are the two positive x-intercepts. Zero is an x-intercept, and negative four is an x-intercept. They're all linear, right? And the end behavior is positive both on right and left. So that's it. Okay, give me thumbs. Okay. There, there's, a, there's another trick we could do with this that I'm going to show you that honestly isn't that incredibly useful right now, but I just want to show it to you as kind of a backup plan and to get you used to this concept before you go to calculus in a couple of years. All right, so I need to go here. I'll tell you what, let's just use this one. We'll just use this one. So I'm going to sketch this guy, right? Okay, there's a couple of ways I, we can do it the way we just did, or okay, that's probably okay. That's probably good. I'll go down a tiny bit more like that. Okay. Here's one way I can do it. I'm going to introduce you to calculus tables. They're really just an analysis tables. And this is kind of the way, I, the way I do it. It's a little differently than the way most of the textbooks do it, but I've come to really like this way. So if, here's how I build these tables. I'm going to start off the top row that defines my column is really just the x-axis. So I'm going to put an x there. I'm going to make a row out of that. And I've got one more row, which is going to be 
f or y, whatever you want to call it, the output of the function. And calculus will add two more rows, one for the first derivative and one for the second derivative when we get there. What's the domain of, of that polynomial, any polynomial for that matter? Are there any restricted values? Right, are there any values I'd have to exclude from the domain where I'm dividing by zero or doing anything crazy like that? No, everybody agree? We're good. There's no value of x I couldn't input into that, correct? So the domain is all real numbers. We don't really even have to know that for this table, but I'm just going to add that because that's something we'll do in a couple years. Now, what are the zeros? Liliana, what are the zeros of that polynomial? Say it again. Negative 2 and, and oh, hold it. No, not, no, no, I want the zeros. What are the, if I set it equal to 0, what would the solutions be? So what's going to be the zero that goes with that factor? Two. And maybe I heard you wrong. So that's two. What would that one be? Negative three. How about that one? Zero. Good. So I get three values. I get negative three, zero, and two. And those are places where the function equals zero. Okay, so notice those are like ordered pairs, aren't they? You know, x on the top, y on the bottom. Okay, so I could graph those right now. I could graph those on my graph. I get 0, negative 3, and positive 2. Okay. Uh, if I want to know what's going on around those zeros, I don't even really have to know any of the tricks I just showed you. All I have to do is pick some test values. Let's pick some test values surrounding those x-intercepts, like negative 10. How about negative 1, positive 1, and positive 10? I don't need to know the value of the function. I just need to know the sign of the function at each of those test values. It's easy to do because I've got the function in factored form up here. So if I evaluate the function at negative 10, what is going to be the sign of each of those three factors? The first factor is going to be if I'm plugging negative 10 in. Negative, right? Agreed. Second one is going to be negative 10 minus 2 is negative. Negative 10 plus 3 is negative. So I get negative times negative times negative. What's the sign of that product? Negative. So I'm getting negative there. How about at negative 1? I'm going to get negative times negative times positive. What's the outcome then? Positive. At positive 1, I'm going to get positive times negative times positive. Negative. And at 10, all three are positive. Okay, so then look what we can do with that table. We can break this thing up into regions. And we know the sign in each region, right? We know the sign to the left of negative 3. The sign is positive. Between negative 3 and 0, the sign of the function... Oh, sorry, I had it backwards, didn't I? To the left of negative 3, the sign of the function is negative. Between negative 3 and 0, it's positive. Between 0 and 2, our test value was negative. And to the right of 2, it was positive. So we know what our function does then, right? It's just going like this. Negative, dips positive, plunges negative. Okay, give me thumbs. So between the two methods, I mean, we're able to sketch any polynomial pretty easily then, right? Let's try another one. How about this one? And we don't even need to make a table out of this. Let's see if we can do this without a table. You can always use the table. It's a great backup plan. But can we do this one by just taking advantage of knowing the end behavior and the nature of the zeros? Okay. Uh, so first of all, where are my zeros? 2 and negative 4. Okay, so there's 0. So there's negative 4. There's 2. And those are my zeros. Okay. Uh, what about the end behavior? Positive or negative, even or odd? 
Keep in mind that's squared. Okay, give me thumbs, you agree? Okay, good. Because I'm going to get an x squared times an x is x cubed, and it's all, there's a positive number out front. So it's positive odd. So the end behavior is going to be doing this, right? It's going to go down over here and up over there. What about the, the nature of the interactions here? So the, the 0 at negative 2 is going to be linear or quadratic? Linear. So it's got to cut through the axis, right? At negative 4, it's, so it's got to bounce. So we're going to get a cut and a bounce, and there's our function. Okay? Give me thumbs. Okay? What do you think? That's kind of, isn't that cool? If you like math, I think you just got to think that's kind of cool.